Uh, welcome to Cover Notes. Um, this is a half hour event that uh, Insurance Europe is organizing to showcase people that make the news in insurance. And today I'm joined by a member of the European Parliament, Markus Ferber. Markus, a very warm welcome. You are the rapporteur, the lead rapporteur for the Solvency 2 review. Very happy to have the discussion today with you. Um, let's get started directly. No um, <laughs> okay, the European <clears throat> Commission, when they uh, published the proposal for the review of Solvency 2, uh, said, and I quote, that the overall objective is to ensure that insurers and reinsurers in the EU keep investing and support the political priorities of the EU. So post-COVID recovery, capital markets union, and of obviously the Green Deal. So what are the Parliament goals for the review? Uh, thank you very much, Michaela. That's a nice question because the Parliament, of course, has no position yet. But if I look to the amendments I got from the various colleagues in the European Parliament, uh, there's a broad approach uh, how to deal with insurance companies in the years to come. So what I'm doing for the moment is to try to find a, a joint position of the European Parliament as the council is already ready to negotiate with us so we are a little bit lazy and behind them having said that i think the three priorities you have outlined are the goals we should address and we should uh, deliver and i hope that the parliament at the end of the day can get behind as our agenda is of course investing in sustainability investing in digitalization. We learn now we have to invest in energy, which means as well uh, cross-border connections and things like that. All things where long-term investors are needed and I do not know a better long-term investor than an insurance company. Yeah, you have of course also uh, placed amendments as lead rapporteur and many have said that you were very ambitious with your amendments. You have mentioned now the geopolitical um, you know, context. Um, if anything, obviously that increases probably the, the need for even more uh, private investment. But why do you think the Commission's proposals were ultimately not sufficient? <laughs> Sorry, as a convinced member of the European Parliament, uh, I could not uh, sleep very well saying, well, the Commission has uh, done everything properly. so. Uh, let's agree on that and that's it. Honestly, if you switch on TV, you see what's happening in the world and the world is changing tremendously and that means we have to adjust our systems. And uh, as I have said already on your first question, uh, the needs which we need for our society, for our economy, for our citizens can only be fulfilled if we attract private capital. We will not be able to finance all of these obligations via public money. We can give some assistance, but we need private money. And therefore, we should do everything which is possible on the banking side for short term and midterm, but on the insurance side, on the long term investment, not making the insurance more risky, but to safeguard that the long term investments are taking place. Therefore, the Commission gave some ideas, but uh, with a good starting point, but in the long run, it's even going down as well, if you follow volatility adjustment and other mechanisms. So therefore, I try to identify where we can release a little bit more of capital, which is less than 1% of total investment of insurance companies. So I'm not so risky as people may think, or Ayopa has mentioned me. Well, let's stay with the topic, you know, riskiness. Insurance company failing is uh, clearly very rare. And generally, I think the insurance sector is considered safe. We have seen that also clearly in the recent crisis, we had repeatedly IOPA uh, statements uh, to the same extent. Um, so now, where do you think we still need to increase protection? Because obviously that is also a topic that you are discussing now with your shadows in the parliament. Yeah, generally, I share your assessment that uh, Solvency 2 delivered a good job and it's called the gold standard in the world. And I said very clearly in the discussions in the European Parliament, we should avoid to make a gold standard, which we have to a silver standard. So what I would prefer is to have a, a gold standard plus uh, and not a silver standard. Having said that, of course, we have to take into account there are some problems. 
we have problems with cross-border companies and national authorities taking care of them. That will not work. That is something I address and I hope colleagues are following me. Of course, we have uh, member states who have insurance guarantee schemes. We have member states who don't have. So we have to give a starting point that we develop something on a European level, which I think Commission has missed, uh, because that creates better protection as well. But in general, uh, we don't see really failures, but we need some adjustments. Mm -hmm. Some adjustments um, we maybe need also for guaranteed products, uh, which is uh, the next topic we are looking at. And there, you know, if I can just venture a little bit, um, we have done a survey with Insurance Europe. Um, we do that regularly um, to ask what is it that policyholders are looking for and especially vulnerable policyholders when it comes, for example, to pension savings. And what we got back now uh, twice in a row was that for them, security guarantee is more important sometimes even than, you know, having um, high returns uh, because rather safe than, you know, uh, a very risky engagement. Now, guaranteed products are, of course, long-term uh, products in the discussion that you also have currently in the context of the Solvency II review. Um, what elements of the proposal will help to achieve that policyholders can be provided with a decent return and still benefit from uh, appropriate protection? Yeah, if you read my proposal, which I have presented to the relevant committee, I try to attract that by releasing some money um, for, for better investments, which of course I hope will then be in the benefit of the policyholders. We have some groups who say we have to avoid that it will be the benefit of the shareholders, and I think that is something we have to address, uh, fair enough. Um, at the end, if both have a benefit, I think we have achieved the best, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that is uh, what we have to do. On, on the other hand, um, I think Solvency II was very conservative, calibrated, and um, in the area of uh, zero uh, invest, uh, uh, interest rates, <clears throat> it was not so dangerous. <laughs> But if I have now inflation rate in, in the member state I come from with 10% in the last month, for example, you have to attract uh, the policies as well. And therefore, uh, I think we should uh, give some more possibilities. As I said, it will not create more risk, but more possibilities. And uh, in comparison to the whole money invested, we speak about less than 1%. I come back to that figure. I think that is very important, as I was blamed, especially by AOPA, that I would open the box of Pandora. I don't see that. Hmm. Talking about long-term um, guarantees uh, and generally the long-term approach of um, the insurance sector, when we look now at supporting uh, the economic recovery, do you think that um, the same proposals would help economic recovery? Or are there other elements in your proposal that could also help contribute to that? Honestly, what I have said, I think, is uh, this other side of the coin. coin yeah. yeah, so both is interlinked to each other. And uh, uh, if you address the one thing, you address the other thing automatically. Uh, as I said, growing interest rates, we have to see how the systems are functioning. But honestly, I did some calculation and some actuaries helped me to do these calculations. Um, the systems work in a high interest rate area as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not so bad what we did in the past with Solvency II. On the other hand, on the long-term adjustments, uh, even uh, it neither works in the low interest rate area nor in the high interest rate area. So therefore, we have to in, in identify uh, some solution. But uh, honestly, uh, if you really want to channel the recovery, equity investment is key. And that's why I address this issue very clearly. Okay, very clear. Now, staying with the topic of investing in Europe. So the Commission has originally said uh, that they were hoping that their proposal would lead to an increased investment capacity of the European insurance industry in the order of 90 billion. And that that would be a boost for Europe. Um, is this the figure that you would agree with, or how do you see uh, this calculation? Uh, and maybe, if I may, 
directly in combination. There are some that uh, are very concerned that that would reduce protection. Again, what gives consumers then also the confidence, or what gives you the confidence that consumers remain protected? Yeah, firstly, the 90 billion which the Commission put in the window is not achieved by the Commission proposal. And I never heard the figure anymore. Mm -hmm. If you take all the long term effects into account, I think it's only one third of these which will be really attracted. My proposals go beyond that, not close to the 90, but according to my calculation, it's between 60 or 70 billion euros being attracted because you have always taken into account the long term effects with the adjustment factors. Um, but uh, having said that, um, I think uh, we should release a little bit this very conservative calibration of solvency too, if we want uh, um, making insurance companies as a uh, solver of the problems. And that is uh, what I think we should achieve together. And the policyholder protection you still see? Honestly. Uh, there are models very easily to calculate if you invest, for example, in uh, electricity infrastructure, in road infrastructure, in rail infrastructure. The return on investment is easily to be calculated. I don't these risks. What we really need at the moment are these kind of investments. Yeah. And we, we need them after 2050 as well, because I've been blamed, oh, gas pipeline you don't need anymore, but we can use it for hydrogen after 2050. So it's the same infrastructure again. So I don't see these problems and that will not be risky in that sense that you are uh, willing to lose money. If you do some wrong calculation, you always lose money, whether you invest in a government bond or in an infrastructure. But honestly, that are things easy to calculate how the return on investment will be. So okay. therefore, I don't see a risk for the policyholder. Okay, and I, I'm an engineer, sorry, yeah. that's why I'm so confident. <laughs> uh, uh, talking about confidence, um, proportionality maybe as a next topic. Um, we are currently, we are having a situation that we have already in, sol in the current Solvency 2 framework proportionality as a key element. We have had to learn that it hasn't really worked. Um, the Commission has now made a number of very good proposals to address proportionality. I think you are adding um, and improving on those. Give us your view on proportionality. And normally I say it makes no sense to compare banking sector with the insurance sector, but on the banking sector I was very active as well to get this small banking box. Uh, when we had the last form on the Capital Requirements Directive. And I was very happy that the Commission took that on board in its proposal on the Solvency 2 as well because I think we have to address some proportionality issues. We have them already in the existing framework, very small, not very engaged, but uh, already existing. Um, but you have to take into account two things. Number one, who is really covered? That is what we are discussing for the moment. We got now some figures from the Commission, which helps hopefully to identify uh, what should be really covered. And secondly, what is the benefit being a non-complex or a a small insurance uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in question of risk. And that is, according to my understanding, not well equipped in the Commission proposal. So I have the title, but I have no benefit. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we should give some benefits as well. And that is what I try to address in the Solvency 2 as well as in the IRD. So if you are non-complex, if you are not so risky, you should have some advantages as well. Less bureaucratic burden, less calculations, and uh, then it makes sense. And the same is in the banking sector as well. Not, you do, do not uh, only need the branding, you have to have some benefits out of this branding. Mm -hmm. I think where I would certainly completely agree with you is that a comparison with insurance and banking or even a read across from banking to insurance certainly doesn't work. We are currently in a situation where this is also um, a little bit of a risk uh, because in parallel to the Solvency 2 discussion, we have um, the reform of the banking rules. And then many are saying in banking, you know, we need to change the system because the banks need to do some catch up in terms of international capital standards. Now in insurance, we don't have a standard. Uh, we have 
uh, currently a concept that is under monitoring and is tested. But what we know is that this international concept, the ICS, um, is uh, certainly not at the same level of uh, capital intensity as um, uh, Solvency 2 uh, in the current form, let alone, you know, potentially in the future form. So European insurers, in other words, are significantly above the international potential standard. And you have uh, American, Asian um, insurers with their capital requirements that would need, in fact, to do a catch up. So when we look at it from an, uh, you know, international competitive element, certainly the European insurance sector is worried that we are being put in the same basket as the banking sector, although our problem is a completely different one. So when it comes to international competitiveness, uh, how do you see it also as a rapporteur for Solvency 2? And I know you are active also <laughs> on the banking side. Well, thanks to give the answer already, no. <laughs> but honestly, um, because I have a long story on that or a long file, because I was discussing that already with Gabriel Bernardino and I said before improving Solvency 2, the existing one, why are we not going throughout the world and promoting it in other financial places as well? And for me, it was very interesting that uh, from other financial places, which I follow on the banking sector as well, or on the market infrastructure, which is my other hobby, Mifi, Mifi um, they took some ideas from Solvency 2 on board, but not in total. Mm -hmm. So what I was missing even in the AYOPA advice and in the commission proposal for redrafting uh, Solvency 2, what is the experience from abroad, how they deal and what have they identified not to take on board and why? Mm -hmm. Is it a special Asian US market issue or is it even a problem we have created for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And then we should have taken that into account. And, and that is what I was missing from the beginning. But honestly, if I look to the amendments from my various colleagues, uh, everyone has only this internal view. No one is looking outside. Um, maybe because insurance work more nationally uh, than globally, although they are globally playing, but with all the national different uh, rulings. On the other hand, um, we have to be aware as well, it makes no sense to weaken ourselves uh, or our insurances um, by um, lowering the standards only to be more competitive. Yeah. We learned in the banking crisis as well that we had some benefits in Europe, especially in comparison to the United States. On the other hand, we have no pressure. And that's the difference to the banking sector, yeah. as we have to fulfill Basel III final, uh, which comes into place in 25, whatever the European legislator says. So the large banks have to apply, whether we are ready or not. In the solvency sector, in the insurance sector, we don't have this time pressure, though there's no one saying us, you have to be ready at a special stage. And uh, therefore, we should use this possibility really to rethink what is necessary to safeguard our system, but what is necessary as well to attract competitiveness, mm. which I fully share. And especially after Brexit, uh, there's a special threat in front of us, as they know very well our markets, as they know very well how we are functioning, and as they look very carefully what we are doing, because Solvency 2 for the moment is in place in the United Kingdom. But we hear more and more rumors, whoever is in Downing Street 10, yeah. <laughs> uh, more and more rumors that they will try to adjust their systems in another way than we are adjusting them. And we are, of course, as a sector, really um, European, but also international minded. You know, we, we have been number one worldwide, um, what is it, seven years ago, and we have we are now on position three. After Asia, you can argue okay, only in number of population that can be explained, but we lost also vis-a-vis -vis the US. And there, you know, you start, where are, are there elements that also come into play on the regulatory side? But as I said, it was never taken into account even by EUPA's advice or by the impact assessment of the European Commission. And it's really hard for the European Parliament to yeah. introduce that now, to be honest, in the battlefield of the three institutions. Yeah. It should be the commission tasks. Yeah.
agree. <laughs> um, now, coming back to, uh, you know, the, the internal discussion within the parliament, where do, do you see currently uh, the most contentious items also, you know, within parliament, within your discussion, if you can talk about it? Yeah, but only by numbers. If you count uh, the amendments dealing with sustainability, one third of all amendments deals with sustainability, which gives me the impression that it's the main issue in the insurance world, which I don't share, mm -hmm. to be honest. And I was blamed that I was uh, deleting the few things. It's not a, a lot of things the uh, Commission has introduced, especially this green supporting factor, where I'm convinced it is the wrong approach. We and I worked personally hard for that since the financial crisis 2009 to improve our systems on a risk-based level. And no one can tell me that green is addressing the risk issue. There are risky investments as well as non-risky investments in the green, in the sustainable sector, as in other sectors as well. To be honest, in the last years, uh, the financial world was very engaged in sustainable products because they performed better. Honestly, that's mm -hmm. the reason. But mm -hmm. you see now, after a half year of war, they perform lower and the markets are moving away uh, to other investments. Very interesting that shows that a lot of the phrases we got in the past was not driven by saving our planet, but uh, driven by having uh, better benefits as they perform better with a good attitude being sustainable. So therefore we should reduce solvency to the risk issue. That is my deep conviction. And uh, as AYOPA did already a study whether um, sustainable uh, investment should get an additional supporting factor and disagreed on this proposal, why should we make a new study? What has changed in the world? I don't see it. Mm. And therefore I'm totally convinced that it makes no sense. And to add another issue, as we got a study from the banking sector a few weeks ago, saying that uh, our banks are invested in 1.5 billion euros in uh, so-called assets with fossil fuels, and they have been mentioned as stranded assets. Sorry, that is nonsense, because <laughs> I have not found one company who does not know what is the challenge. And everyone knows Europe will be uh, CO2 neutral in 2050. So every company has to prepare itself. Mm. And, and therefore, um, you can't say that a company who is for the moment using fossil fuels, but has a plan how to get rid of that and how to reorganize its company to 2050. And if an uh, insurance company says, wow, that's attractive for me, I want to invest there because I think that makes sense and they have a good plan and I will uh, have benefit out of that. Even for my policyholders, why should an insurance company not invest there? I have not found anyone to explain that to me. And therefore I'm not convinced that we have to address the sustainability issues in the prudential regulation. Uh, we address them in the Fit for 55 package. We will have further package after 2030. Uh, to achieve our common goal 2050 being CO2 neutral, but uh, solvency 2 is not the right tool to address that. That is my deep conviction. So we will see what's going to happen. Even the council was not a front runner to introduce additional measurements um, in the sustainability area. The only thing is they agreed that the EUPA should to uh, uh, approve whether a green supporting factor is successful or not. If that is the only thing at the end of the day and the spirit of compromise, okay. But I have not seen why Europa should now say uh, the world has changed and we introduce a green supporting factor. On the banking side, we don't have these proposals. Mm. And that is the other thing. Why do we have to discuss it on the insurance world and we are not discussing it in the banking world? And even there, I have not found an argument convincing me. So therefore, if that is at the end uh, the solution of the problems, okay. But uh, there are so many amendments which go far beyond of a prudential regulation. That I'm really convinced that will uh, lead us uh, in a nightmare and not in a solution. Can I maybe... Sorry for being so long, no, but as you, no, one third of amendments is dealing with that. Um, 
we can maybe stick a little bit with the sustainability. Um, I mean, you you have almost um, been perceived as very provocative, but also when I look at it from an insurance uh, sector perspective, what we are seeing is, of course, that even if Solvency II, um, you know, would address it, it would duplicate to other texts that we are in any case already subject to. You know, we have, of course, all the sustainability reporting uh, addressed to us. Uh, as you said, uh, various packages out there, they are, um, you know, addressing and also obviously um, completely valid for the insurance sector. So for us, what we also see is an additional problem with duplication that could lead to uh, challenges moving forward also on the compliance side. But I take it that this is something... No, no, but if I may add, sorry, yeah. Michaela, to interrupt you, but um, I, I fully share your view, and that was my motivation to say, come on, we have all this non-financial reporting or sustainable uh, reporting, which we have introduced already. It's, it's fully it, applicable. It's, it's applicable. On the other hand, if you look to a lot of the amendments, they are addressing already issues which are covered by other pieces of legislation, mm -hmm. and they're really wondering why colleagues have not understood that a horizontal regulation, uh, for example, woman on board, is already solved. I do not need a special regulation for insurance companies. Mm -hmm. There's a horizontal regulation. Um, we have a special regulation for insurance for cars. So why do I have to address this again? Mm -hmm. and, and that creates even an overload and an environment where uh, insurance companies are not able to fulfill all the criterions because especially it's not solvency, it's IRD. Uh, I have to deliver something according to IRD, which is in opposition of the idea of the existing directive, but I have to fulfill that as well. Yeah. And, and that is what I try to discuss now with my colleagues. Come on, everything which is uh, covered, or conglomerates regulation, which is another issue we have to address in the solvency. There are a lot of things existing and we have to take them into account. And uh, I thought Commission is more aware of that and uh, assisting us in the negotiations. Uh, I hope in the months to come they will do so, because it makes no sense to address the same issue two, three times. Mm -hmm. That will not create a better environment, it creates a mess. And with yeah. a mess, the companies are lost, and if the companies are lost, me as a policyholder, I'm lost as well. Yeah. We have a few minutes left. I want to really also ask you the question about IRD. Where are you on IRD in your internal discussion? And is there uh, also a risk that, you know, when you look at the timetable, will it split? Um, can you say something around uh, that when it comes to solvency two and IRD? So we try to keep it together, that's for sure. Um, Honestly, in IRD, we are a little bit further than in uh, uh, Solvency II, as we found more common understanding in the first rounds of negotiations. Uh, but I hear that the Council is far away. On the other hand, I have proposal on the table as well to introduce a, a, a total well-equipped insurance guarantee scheme, which I said from the early beginning, without EUPA technical advice, without proper impact assessment, mm -hmm. we cannot do it via the IRD. On the other hand, and that is what I'm really, what I'm, why I'm disappointed about this proposal. So IRD is delivering a roof, but the fundament is an IGS in all member states. And then you need minimum standards, as we started in the banking sector, minimum standards of harmonization before you start recovery and resolution. So, but as commission has started with that, we have to deal with that. But we, one of my ideas is uh, to give some time frame by until the IGS has to be developed and the Commission should come up with proposals and then it's up to the legislators to, to think on. But I hear that the Council is still very reluctant on this issue and not very engaged. So we'll see what's going to happen. I try to keep the things together as I have a lot of amendments on the IRD which I think are more in the competence of Solvency 2 and some amendments in Solvency 2 which are more an issue for IRD mm -hmm. as I have more or less the same negotiation team I think we can sort that out but um, if the council is not ready we will see what's going to happen so most probably we will discuss Solvency 2 separately and IRD at a later stage because of the council not because of us. Okay look Thank you very much for this insight. I think we really managed uh, to cover a lot of ground uh, in the last uh, 30 minutes. Thank you for your time. 
and all the best for your future negotiations. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>